Let's move on to the final part of this lecture, which is on population genetics. Okay, so population size directly affects genetic variation. One thing we have to take note of is how the size of a population affects how varied the genes are. Well, we mentioned earlier that genetic drift is less common in large populations, right? So it's kind of related to that. Recall that genetic drift is a change in allele frequencies in a population due to chance. That's already clear. Although it can happen to populations of any size, this phenomenon is much more pronounced in smaller populations. We also mentioned that earlier when we were discussing the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium model, right? Why is this so? This is because in small populations, the chances of allele frequencies changing is much more likely due to the lower number of individuals present in the population. To help you visualize, for example, you say that you have a population of beetles numbering 100. Say that 10 of these beetles are red and 90 are blue. And say that a storm wipes out all 10 of the red beetles. They didn't die because of their color, so this is genetic drift. However, they still got wiped out, right? So contrast that with, let's say, a beetle population of 100,000, with 10,000 of them being red beetles. It's much more likely that some of these red beetles will survive the storm, right? Since there's so many, okay? So that shows you how larger populations are more resistant to genetic variation. A more concrete example of this is seen in a study by Thomas Ledig in Mexico. So he focused, he and his colleagues focused on Paisia Chihuahuana, or the Chihuahua spruce, which is found in the mountains of Sierra Madre in Mexico. Yes, they also have a Sierra Madre, okay? So Paisia Chihuahuana used to have a larger distribution but this range is now limited due to changes in climate. Now, the populations of Chihuahua spruce are just found in fragmented areas. And, you know, there are different populations, right? And these populations range in abundance from 15 individuals to more than 20,000 individuals each. So Ledig and his colleagues uh, surveyed the effects of population size and genetic diversity in the spruce. They were able to compare, right? Because there were separate populations, each with different numbers of individuals. And what they found was there was a positive relationship between population size and genetic diversity, with the larger populations being more diverse, as you can see here. Okay? Right? Larger population size, higher up on the genetic diversity scale. Lower populations being found lower on the genetic diversity scale. Okay, so what's the relationship with genetic drift? Well, the smaller populations of Chihuahua spruce, of course, have higher chances of specific alleles being wiped out due to natural conditions. So what are these natural conditions? We have fires or storms, lightning strikes, for example, that cause fires. Okay. So inbreeding or mating with related individuals also affects genetic variation. Inbreeding is much more common in a small population, of course, compared to a larger population. Why? Because there's less of a choice and more chances of encountering related individuals in a smaller population. So, how does inbreeding affect genetic variation within a population? Well, variation decreases. Genetic variation decreases with more inbreeding. How's this so? Well, this is because homozygosity is increased and heterozygosity is decreased in the offspring and consequently in the population. So recall from your genetics, these two terms, right? Homozygosity and heterozygosity. So homozygosity refers to an organism possessing two identical forms of a gene, whereas Heterozygosity refers to an organism possessing different forms of the gene. Diba? So homozygous and heterozygous. So a high amount of heterozygosity in the population leads to more genetic diversity. 
So an example, again, we have a study by Richard Frankham and Catherine Rolfe. Okay, so they, fo uh, they, focused on, they focused on genetic variations in different species and they stated that inbreeding can contribute to higher rates of extinction. And another specific study showed this. Okay? So this study by Ilex Sakeri and colleagues focused on the, the butterfly species Militea cinctia, or the Granville fritillary. Okay? So this study on the Granville fritillary aimed to survey the effects of inbreeding on butterfly genetic diversity for this species. So, yeah, Sakeri and colleagues surveyed 1,600 meadows and found that the number of meadows where M. cinctia were found varied across the years. So they found that M. cinctia was present in 524 meadows in one year, and then 401 meadows the following year, then 384 the following year, and 320 the following year. Okay, so you don't have to be a genius to observe that. They're found in fewer, in fewer meadows as the years passed. And then they also did genetic studies on the butterflies that they found. So you know, what did they find? Well, they found that some populations, particularly the smaller ones, the smaller populations, had higher chances of inbreeding. And these populations with high inbreeding rates were also more likely to become extinct. So they used heterozygosity, by the way, as a measure of the chances of inbreeding, with higher heter heterozygosity associated with lower inbreeding chances. So they found that low heterozygosity or high inbreeding, had smaller larvae and lower survival rates during the winter. The pupa stage of these individuals also stayed in cocoons for a longer time, which exposed them to parasites and predators, right? So, you know, these things collectively account for the lower survival rate of the offspring of inbred butterflies. So it's not just population sizes per se, that affect genetic variation. There are also other factors, and some of these are also either directly or indirectly affected by population size. One such factor is if a population is found on the mainland or in an island, on an island. Okay? A study by Richard Franklin, uh, sorry, not Franklin, Richard Frankham, focused on mainland and island populations and the differences in the genetic variations of these populations. Why do you focus on that? Well, he was driven by the fact that extinctions are much more common for island species compared to mainland species. <clears throat> so, Frankham had a few hypotheses, and one of these is that since island populations usually had lower genetic variation compa uh, compared to mainland species, extinctions were much more common. Again, What's the connection between genetic variation and extinction? Low variation means fewer or smaller chances of proper responses to environmental challenges being present in that population, right? Of course, this is basing it on the idea of lower genetic variations for islands. Is this really the case? Do island populations really have lower genetic variability compared to mainland populations? Well. According to his results, as you can see here, yes. So he studied existing data on many populations and many species. And his results supported the idea that island populations really have lower genetic diversity. Okay? So he did comparisons. And as you can see in this graph, there were overwhelmingly more mainland species that are more varied compared to island species than the other way around. So, you've already learned about mating systems in life history strategies, right? So, hopefully, you've already finished that lecture. So, how do these mating systems affect genetic diversity? Well, first, let's recall the different types. We have monogamy, with a one-to-one, one-is-to-one male-to-female mating pair for the rest of their lives. Then there's polygamy with multiple males or multiple females. Then we have you know, polygyny for multiple females for one male. 
and polyandry for multiple males for one female. So again, how do these mating systems affect genetic diversity? Well, in monogamy, there's a reduction in genetic variation. Why? Because it's the same male and the same female mating over and over and over again for their entire lives. The stock of genes is the same for the parents. Of course, if there are enough monogamous pairs in a population, let's say in a large population, then this shouldn't be a problem. Smaller populations, of course, will have lower genetic variation, especially with monogamy. Because you don't mix the genes as much, right? Okay. So polygamy, on the other hand, often leads to higher amounts of genetic diversity. Regarding polygyny, well, the effects are actually mixed. While it reduces the contribution of multiple males on the next generation's genes, oh, by the way, why? Because only one male sires multiple offspring from different females, right? So there's a reduction in contribution for multiple males. Okay. So while this is present, it's been found that one male siring multiple females or siring offspring for multiple females can also increase genetic diversity. How? Well, scientists found that polygyny can lead to an increase in the diversity of the X chromosomes compared to the autosomes. So yeah, it's a mixed bag actually for polygyny. There are some factors that decrease diversity, like, you know, um, reducing the chances of more males siring offspring. And then there are some that increase diversity, like increasing the X chromosomes diversity compared to the autosomes. Okay, what about polyandry? Well, polyandry increases genetic variability within families due to having different fathers, right? So this can also reduce the chances of inbreeding and homozygosity, which can actually increase genetic variation. Of course, again, it's a mixed bag, pretty much like polygyny, since it's one female just contributing to all offspring. So if you think about it, higher population sizes for both polygyny and polyandry can have significant effects on variation. Okay? Small population sizes are likely to be or are less likely to be varied due to a mixture of the different factors that we've mentioned earlier, as well as inbreeding and so on. So I'm sure you're also familiar with artificial selection. Okay? Artificial selection involves, well, humans, of course. This is when we select specific traits that we like in organisms and specifically breed individuals with these traits so that the offspring that they have will be more likely to have these traits. Cattle are a good example, right? How? Farmer and, uh, farmers and cattle keepers usually select the individuals with the best muscle quality or milk production capacity and let them breed. Why? More profit, of course. You get more milk, you're, you get better quality meat, and so on. So how does artificial selection affect genetic variation? Well, of course, this is bad for genetic variability, right? This is because we're choosing traits and breeding for them with the other traits being left behind. Okay, so they don't get to reproduce as much if, you, if they don't have the traits that we like. Okay, but take note. Take note that this is usually for captive populations. So the effects of artificial selection, they're rarely seen in nature, in nature alone. Okay, what about populations seen outside captivity? Well, the traits we select for in artificial selection aren't necessarily the ones that give advantages to the organisms themselves. We select these traits for the advantages that they give us. Okay, so if these artificially selected organisms go back out into the wild, well, it probably won't be good for them. They probably won't be able to survive for very long. I mean, just imagine, say, a chihuahua, which we've artificially bred going back out into the wild, right? Um, chihuahua dog, not chihuahua spruce. Okay, so imagine a little chihuahua going back out into the wild. It probably won't survive very long. And then aside from artificial selection that can be seen in plants and animals, for example, 
the use of pesticides not only kills target organisms that are considered pests, these pesticides also kill or other organisms that come into contact with the pesticides themselves. Okay? What's more worrisome is how organisms that survive these pesticides eventually become resistant to their toxic effects. What does this mean? What's the consequence? This means that we can eventually get chemical resistant pests. And that's very bad, right? And the same can be said of antibiotics, right? So improper antibiotic use has led to drug-resistant bacterial strains, which is, of course, also very bad. You are familiar, for example, with MRSA, right? MRSA or Methicillin-Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So MRSA is particularly problematic because it's resistant to many common antibacterial or antibiotic drugs. So yeah, if we're not careful, we'll get more strains of drug-resistant bacteria in the future. By the way, this photo here is a condition called necrotizing fasciitis. Also known as flesh-eating disease. Okay? So this is when bacteria cause necrosis of body tissues. And yeah, well, a strain of MRSA accounts for a lot of cases of necrotizing fasciitis. So yeah. That's just one of the problems that MRSA is causing. And, you know, it's not exactly easy to treat since it's resistant to antibiotics. Okay, so this is the last slide. So just keep in mind, there are many contributors to what we know now about evolution. It's not just Darwin, okay? It's not just Wallace. There are a lot of other scientists that contributed to what we know now about evolution. Okay? So contrary to popular belief, evolution isn't necessarily a slow process. There's also the idea of punctuated equilibrium, right? And a common misconception is that natural selection is common in nature. That's not necessarily the case. Like what we've said earlier, genetic drift is possibly more common than natural selection. Okay? And then we've said this over and over again. Larger populations usually have more genetic variation. And it's not just population size that affects genetic variation. Many other factors also do, as we have discussed earlier. Okay, so that concludes this lesson. Um, hope you have a good day or night. Thank you.